Well, if we were talking about my inability to multitask last week, sorry guys, if you're a multitasker, but if you are, could you keep your talent quiet? Because if the word gets out that men can multitask, well, some of us are in trouble. And now this week, we're moving to a topic that I feel pretty inadequate to talk about because I would rate myself quite low on a scale of one to 10. This week, we're talking about listening. That's right, listening. You see, my problem or my problems are, uh, I get distracted, uh, I lose focus, my mind wanders, it just goes everywhere, and then uh, I sometimes will just tune out. I'll just kind of disappear in the midst of the conversation. Um, sometimes I'm just too busy thinking about my reply and forget all about what the speaker is trying to tell me. And then I, I get distracted. Oh, that's right. I think I already said that, but that's true. I get distracted. So how do I combat my inadequate listening skills? Okay, I try. If you, if you want to know more about this, well, you can just talk to my wife, Jan. But here's what I try to do, and here's what she tries to help me with. Number one, to focus on the speaker. How do I do that? Well, the second thing is, is to look them in the eye. In other words, to make eye contact and to keep eye contact. The third thing is, is that if we're meeting, it's best for me if I take notes. That way, I can remember and recall better what um, this person or individual has been trying to tell me. Number four is to fight the, res to fight, um, the temptation to uh, formulate a response and to just concentrate on what someone is trying to tell me. And then the last thing is, is to repeat what the speaker has said to make sure that my response is not so out there that you know I wasn't listening. And you know what? I know that I'm not alone in this. Jan and I were listening to a marriage video several years ago, and the session leader, uh, the session leader presenter, who uh, uh, was a man and uh, who happens to also be a pastor. By the way, the, uh, the, the marriage sessions are called Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage, and if you haven't seen them, they're well worth um, listening to and watching. You can find them on YouTube. But um, he said this in one of his talks. He said, I was talking with a woman who told me, I asked my husband once to do something a while ago, and he still hasn't done it. And Mark's reply, the, the speaker, the presenter, his reply was, you only asked him once? Well, I laughed. And I think I may have gotten an elbow for that, but there is a lot more to the story. And if you want some of the context for this, well, I can supply that for you. You see, apparently, I'm not alone. There's a story that, that circulates that goes like this. A doctor was shocked when he saw one of his oldest patients at a park laughing and walking with a much younger woman. When he got a chance, the doctor buttonholed the old man and asked, Wow, you sure are feeling a lot better, aren't you? And the elderly patient replied, Well, yes, doctor. I'm just taking your orders. You said, get a hot mama and be cheerful. And the doctor said, I didn't say that. I said, you've got a heart murmur. Be careful. <laughs> Apparently, there's a difference between hearing and listening. Just to summarize, to hear is to use your ears only. To listen is to use your body's other senses too. Well, our story today is the story of Samuel. And Samuel forms the bridge from the period of the judges to the time of the kings in Israel's history. Samuel, you'll find two books in the Old Testament named after him, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Now Samuel is the one who is between these two verses, Judges chapter 21, verse 25, that says, In those days Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. So that's one end. And then on the other end, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, 
we, we read, do everything they say to you, the Lord replied. He's talking to Samuel, by the way. Do everything they say to you, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. You see, the people of Israel wanted a king, just like all of the other nations around them. Now, the preamble to Samuel's story begins with a godly mom. How many times do we hear that or read about that? I know it's not always the case, but it happens often. There's a godly mom behind um, the man in the story. Now, Samuel's story does not begin in the perfect home. His father is married to two wives. And though it was an accepted custom in those days, if a woman was found to be barren, who was not able to bear a child, please understand this, that God did not approve of having more than one wife at a time. Now, in this story, in Samuel's story, Elkanah is the dad or the husband, and he has two wives. One is Penina, and she had children, but the other is Hannah, and she did not. In all likelihood, because Hannah could not have children, Elkanah then followed the customs of the day, not God's uh, plan, uh, but the custom of the day, and then took a second wife. So, Penina has children, Hannah does not. Now, it says in 1 Samuel 1, it tells us that Elkanah loved Hannah. But every year when Elkanah traveled to Shiloh to worship and present offerings at the temple, he would give a portion of the meat to Penina and a portion to each of her children. Now, he also gave a portion to Hannah. But Hannah would only receive one portion and Penina would receive one portion plus. Now, Penina taunted and mocked Hannah. And this whole ordeal repeated itself year after year. It was incredibly painful for Hannah. Each time we're told Hannah would be reduced to tears and she would lose her appetite. She just would not be able to eat. This played out year after year after year. Now, once after a sacrificial meal at the tabernacle, Hannah got up and she went to pray. Eli the priest overheard her praying. Hannah, Hannah, praying Hannah, faithful Hannah. Every year, in spite of what happened, she made this journey to the tabernacle. Here's Hannah weeping, Hannah imploring, Hannah desperate. Can I just pause here for a moment and just ask you this? Can you think of a time in your life when you were desperate for something? You were so desperate, you were driven to God in prayer. You were imploring, you were begging him, you were weeping, you were crying, pouring out your heart to God for an answer to your circumstances. Do you recall what happened? Just think about that. That's what Hannah was experiencing in the uh, beginning part of the story of Samuel. Now, to pick up the story, we can begin in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10. So if you have your Bibles, go there. If you use a Bible app, go ahead and open it up. 1 Samuel chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow. O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. Now, where have you heard this before? We talked about this just a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about Samson. This is in reference to a Nazarite vow those who would take a special vow of dedication to the Lord. Verse 12, as she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her, seeing her lips moving but hearing no sound. He thought she had been drinking. Must you come here drunk, he demanded? Throw away your wine. Oh no, sir, she replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger. 
but I'm very discouraged, and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think that I'm a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. God heard Hannah's prayer. When she and Alcanah had returned from their visit to the tabernacle, they slept together, and God opened her womb, and in due time, Hannah gave birth to a son. Now, to carry on in the story, go to verse um, 24 in 1 Samuel chapter 1. When the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh. They brought along a three-year-old bull for the sacrifice and a basket of flour and some wine. After sacrificing the bull, they brought the boy to Eli. Sir, do you remember me, Hannah asked? I am the woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord. I asked the Lord to give me this boy, and he has granted my request. Now I'm giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worshiped the Lord there. Just a few comments here. I'm well aware of the extraordinary act that is recorded here. No one should ever think that they're obligated to do the same. You know, here at Summerland Alliance, we practice child dedications, and this is the story we often refer to as a biblical example. But never do we ask any parent to leave their child in the care of the church. What you are is a witness to the depth of one poor woman's despair, the cultural context of being a woman unable to bear a child, a stigma that affects some women to this day, something that we must do everything we can to protect a woman from and affirm the value and importance of a woman regardless of their physical limitation. And then you're a witness to the promise that Hannah made when she prayed. I'm also painfully aware that Hannah's actions do not always result in the same positive outcome. And you know also, in the context that we're living in in these days, one should not associate what is happening here with something like the residential school situation that we're now dealing with in Canada. They're very different scenarios. But I can't even come close to imagining the kind of pain and hurt that many are feeling reading or hearing a story like this or, or what those feelings or thoughts may be when you consider what is um, taking place in the story of Hannah and Samuel. Now, just to come back to our story, to take a look at chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse um, 1. This is Hannah's prayer of praise after she has dedicated her child to the Lord and has given um, her son to Eli for him to be raised in God's service and in the um, carrying out of priestly duties, learning all of that from a young, uh, a young child, okay? So she has this prayer of praise, and it's found in chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 1. Then Hannah prayed, My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have an answer for my enemies. I rejoice because you rescued me. No one is holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Stop acting so proud and haughty. Don't speak with such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows what you have done. He will judge your actions. The bow of the mighty is now broken, and those who stumbled are now strong. Those who were well-fed are now starving, and those who were starving are now full. The childless woman now has seven children, and the woman with many children wastes away. The Lord gives both death and life. He brings some down to the grave, but raises others up. The Lord makes some poor and others rich. He brings some down and lifts others up. 
He lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. He sets them among princes, placing them in seats of honor. For all the earth is the Lord's, and he has set the world in order. He will protect his faithful ones, but the wicked will disappear in darkness. No one will succeed by strength alone. Those who fight against the Lord will be shattered. He thunders against them from heaven. The Lord judges throughout the earth. He gives power to his king. He increases the strength of his anointed one. Then Elkanah returned home to Ramah without Samuel. And the boy served the Lord by assisting Eli, the priest. Wow. I don't want us to miss the raw emotion of her prayer. Have you ever felt afraid to voice your true feelings to God about someone or a situation that you're facing or have experienced? Take a page from Hannah's prayer book. It's worth a read and maybe more than once. Now, I mean, what she has prayed is not something that is literally applied to her. But figuratively, she's talking about the fullness of her heart in that God has answered her prayer and given her Samuel. She is over the top, thrilled and rejoicing and grateful and humbled that God has seen fit to bless her in this way. Now, you can read the rest of, uh, or you can read the backdrop for the next part of Samuel's story in the rest of 1 Samuel chapter 2, going from verse 12 to verse 26. Just to say that the young boy Samuel continued to serve the Lord. He grew taller and he grew in favor with the Lord and with the people. Samuel would be God's next priest. He would be faithful. The Bible tells us this. He would be faithful. He would serve the Lord. He would do what God desired. However, not everything was perfect for Samuel because like Eli, his mentor, Eli's sons did not follow the Lord, neither did Samuel's. Samuel's sons would not follow after the Lord either. Now, we're told in the scriptures that in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare and visions were quite uncommon. One night, Eli had gone to bed. He was very old, and he was nearly blind. Samuel was sleeping. When he heard his name called, the Lord said, Samuel. And Samuel said, yes, what is it? He got up, and he ran to Eli, thinking that it was Eli who was calling him. And Samuel said to Eli, here I am. Did you call me? And Eli said to Samuel, no, I didn't call you. Just go back to bed. Now, the Lord called Samuel a second time. Now, the same exchange was repeated. Samuel didn't know it was the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So, uh, Eli said to Samuel, it wasn't me. Just go back to bed. Now, the Lord called um, Samuel a third time. And again, Samuel went up, uh, he got up and he went to Eli. And then Eli clued in. Now, let's go back to the story and just pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. Um, then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, go and lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Here we go, listening. So Samuel went back to bed, and the Lord came and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, speak, your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am about to do a shocking thing in Israel. I'm going to carry out all of my threats against Eli and his family from beginning to end. I have warned him that judgment is coming upon his family forever because his sons are blaspheming God and he hasn't disciplined them. So I vowed that the sins of Eli and his sons will never be forgiven by sacrifices or offerings. Wow. That's the message that he gets. Let me just make two comments here. Number one, I want us to understand something. God will call you. 
And when he does, he will call you by name. Isaiah 43, verse 1 reminds us, But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says, You know what? You can insert your name here where Jacob and Israel are used. You can put your name in here. So if it was for me, I could say, But now, Rick, listen to the Lord who created you. Rick, the one who formed you says, Put your name in there. Here's what God says. Don't be afraid, for I have redeemed you. We talked about this uh, last week. Don't be afraid. I have redeemed you. Here it is. I have called you by name. You are mine. God will call you. And when he does, he will call you by name. Now here's the second thing. When he calls you, answer Answer in the same way. Here I am. Your servant is listening. Be ready. Be willing. Be humble. Be ready to engage in what God is going to say to you. Focus. Okay? Focus and listen. Practice your listening skills as he talks to you, as he calls you. Listen to what he has to say. The Hebrew word here is the word Shema. Shema, what does it mean? It means to hear intelligently, to listen attentively. It means to obey. The intent of listening is to do what you are being asked to do, to hear intelligently, to listen attentively. Remember, to hear is just to use your ears only, but to listen is to engage the other parts of your body in the midst of what is going on. So you are locked in to what the speaker is saying. Hear intelligently, listen attentively with the intent of obeying. This word, Shema, occurs over a thousand times, actually over 1,100 times in the Old Testament. It's very important to listen. You know, we're told in the book of James, by the way, to be slow to speak, to be quick to listen. So here's my question. Has God called you? Has he spoken to you? When did that happen? And what were the circumstances? And do you remember what the outcome was. I remember a time in my life when I was really struggling with understanding God's purpose and his intent for my life. And someone was talking to me and giving me advice as to how God would work and what he expected me to be doing so that he could work in and through my life. And he laid it out to me very pointedly as to what exactly needed to happen. And you know, as, as he talked to me, I just didn't agree. I didn't feel that what I was hearing was right. And, and one evening after a Sunday evening service, I remember being at the front and just crying out to God, God, how am I supposed to um, uh, figure this out? How are you going to work in and through my life? I was uh, in, in college at the time. I was just getting ready for my fourth year at Bible college. And God said it so clearly to me in that evening. Don't worry about it. I have already done what you need me to do. It's all taken care of. I love you and I will work my plan and purpose through your life. And I remember it as clearly as we're talking right now. You see, I can think of at least eight ways that God speaks to us. Number one, God speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through the Bible. God spoke through the prophets. Samuel was a prophet. In fact, one of the, uh, the words for Samuel was that uh, he was a seer. He could see the things of God. He was a prophet who spoke the words of God. So uh, God spoke through the prophets, and we read about the prophets in the Old Testament and throughout the Bible. Now he speaks to us through his son Jesus, who is the word. And there are people that have the gift of prophecy and it's very valuable to listen to those people that manifest that gift as they talk about the things of God to us. God speaks through circumstances. 
He speaks through circumstances, uh, some of them being quite dramatic, like Jonah, who failed to heed God's direction and found himself in the belly of a whale. It got Jonah's attention. God speaks to us through people. A word that is more than just a passing conversation. Sometimes people will say things directly to us that confirm God's direction. We may have read something in the Bible and someone just out of the blue may say something to us that fits perfectly with what we read or heard. Number four, God speaks through wise counselors. Proverbs repeatedly says to seek wisdom through the wise counsel of others. Number five, God also speaks to us through nature or creation. And some of us find ourselves communing with God in wonderful and deep ways when we're taking hikes or walks in the woods. Psalm 19 verses 1 to 4 says, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. Wonderful. God speaks to us through dreams and visions. Joel chapter 2 verse 28 tells us about that. God speaks to us through our thoughts. Amos chapter 4 verse 13 says he reveals his thoughts to mankind. And then God speaks to us in the quiet. I think he is heard best in the stillness. Psalm 46 verse 10 simply says, be still and know that I am God. Stop, cease, just kind of withdraw and disconnect and let God speak to, speak to us. He's always speaking. Are we listening? Let me ask, is your world too loud for you to hear him? Chris Tomlin wrote a song that says, it, it's called In the Secret. And it says this, in the secret, in the quiet place, in the stillness, you are there. In the secret, in the quiet hour, I wait only for you because I want to know you more. I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. I want to know you more. God's always speaking. Are we listening? I came across this little um, story that's entitled, When God Whispers. The man whispered, God, speak to me. And a metal lark sang, but the man didn't hear. So the man yelled, God, speak to me. And the thunder rolled across the sky, but the man didn't listen. The man looked around and said, God, let me see you. And a star shone brightly. The man didn't see. And the man shouted, God, show me a miracle. And a life was born. But the man didn't notice. So the man cried out in despair, touch me, God, and let me know that you are here. Whereupon God reached down and touched the man. But the man brushed the butterfly away and walked on. How easy is it in our hurly burly life in the busyness of all that we are involved in to miss the word of God, the call of God, the touch of God, the view of God. Oh, that we would just be quiet and still and know that he is God. Let me just conclude this message with these four thoughts. Number one, let me go back to the story of 1 Samuel. Uh, of Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and go to verse 19. Look at this. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. And all Israel from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh. This was kind of like his office. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and gave messages to Samuel there at the tabernacle. And Samuel's words went out to all the people of Israel. Now, what were those words? Well, in Samuel's farewell address to the nation, if you go to 1 Samuel chapter 12, 
turn there. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and go to verse 20. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20. Samuel's farewell address to the nation of Israel. It says, Don't be afraid, Samuel reassured them. You have certainly done wrong. But make sure now that you worship the Lord with all your heart and don't turn your back on him. Don't go back to worshiping worthless idols that cannot help or rescue you. They are totally useless. The Lord will not abandon his people because that would dishonor his great name. For it has pleased the Lord to make you his very own people. Verse 23, notice this. As for me, I will certainly not sin against the Lord by ending my prayers for you. And I will continue to teach you what is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and faithfully serve him. Think of all the wonderful things he has done for you. But if you continue to sin, you and your king will be swept away. You know what I find so wonderful here is that the importance of prayer is complete. You have Samuel, the prophet. You have Samuel, the priest. And you have Samuel, the prayer warrior. Prophet, the seer, the one who saw the things of God, the one who was the priest who represented God before the people, the one who spoke the very words of God to the people, and the one who prayed for them, prophet, priest, and prayer warrior. Isn't it wonderful to think that Samuel was the result of his mother's prayer? That his mother who prayed for him and then who prayed that prayer that's recorded in chapter 2 is the one who said, God forbid that I would ever sin by ceasing to pray for you. I will continue to do that to the very day I die. And I will continue to teach you and instruct you in the ways of God. What Hannah began, Samuel carried on. He would not sin against God by ceasing to pray for God's people. Now, here's something else. You know, when I was talking earlier at the beginning of this message as to how to uh, combat my inadequate listening skills, apply those to God himself. That I would stop trying to formulate a response to him, but listen to what he has to say. And even to take notes if I need to, so I can recall what he has told me. That I would write down what he says. Make notes in my Bible. That I would look for ways to continue to hear God's voice to me. That my mind would not become distracted. That it would not wander off. But that it would be fixed on Jesus. And the last thing that I want to say is another song that came to mind. It's called The Word of God Speak. It's a song by Bart, Bart Millard and Pete Kipley. Word of God Speak. It says this, I'm finding myself at a loss for words. And the funny thing is, is it's okay. The last thing I need is to be heard, but to hear what you would say. Word of God Speak. Would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God, speak. Your servant is listening. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you speak to us. You speak to us in a variety of ways. We thank you that you love us enough and you so want to be in relationship with us that you're constantly communicating with us. Would you help us to do what we need to do to hear your voice, to listen, to listen attentively, to hear intelligently, and to obey what you would have to say to us. Thank you for the example of Samuel Thank you for his steadfastness and his faithfulness. May we be known for the same qualities that in the midst of all that we experience and deal with in our lives, we would make the time to be still 
to come apart, to come away, and to be in your presence and to listen. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks so much for watching. God bless. Uh, appreciate you watching this video. We'll see you again next time. Bye for now.